What do you know that makes you healthy? Many of you may have answered exercise. Well, exercise is going to lower our risk of mortality by about 23 to 33%. What about eating fruits and vegetables? So important, so healthy. Eating fruits and vegetables can reduce your risk of death by about 26%. What about the Mediterranean diet? Okay, I'm throwing in some fish, but I'm still getting healthy olive oil. Eating the Mediterranean diet can reduce your risk of death by about 21%. But there is something even deeper that runs through us on a primordial level. And that is the safety and security that can come from having a strong support network of friends and family. Simply having this strong support network can lower our risk of death by about 45%, even if you don't come from a family that is there to help show you support volunteering and giving to others can help to reduce your risk of death by about 22 to 44 percent. Now, of course, we have to take these numbers with a grain of salt, but there's more to being healthy than just the way that we eat and the way that we exercise and the way that we sleep. There is something powerful about how friendship, optimism, and kindness can help us live longer and more exuberant lives. Welcome to The Lindsay Elmore Show, a podcast for people who deserve to be healthy with honest, open, and enlightening conversations with doctors, thought leaders, creatives, and spiritual gurus. You'll walk away with simple and tangible tips and tricks that allow you to live your healthiest life so you can pursue your dreams, overcome obstacles, and leave your mark. Marta Zaraska, welcome to The Lindsay Elmore Show. Thank you so much for inviting me, Lindsay. This past year has been a huge transition for all of us, and many people have found themselves spending much and much more time by themselves, alone, with their thoughts, which can lead us into spirals of loneliness and depression and anhedonia, where you just don't want to do anything when you don't have the connection with others. Talk to us about why it is so harmful to our psyche and ultimately to our body as a whole to be by ourselves for extended periods of time. I mean, you know, in general, humans are social apes. We evolved to be part of a tribe. Uh, You know, just look at our cousins, chimpanzees, for instance, you know, they are always surrounded by the other members of their tribe. And in our evolutionary past, if you were alone, uh, it was a sign that things went wrong for you. Uh, Basically, it, it meant that you were ostracized, basically kicked out of the tribe for some reason, or got gotten lost, and you were in danger because you were in danger to fall victim to predators, you could have gotten wounded and nobody that would be there to help you. So basically being alone was a dangerous state and our bodies prepared for that. So when we are alone, we have the special systems that turn on uh, that actually act on the level of our genetic expression. Uh, that basically we change into protecting our bodies from being wounded. So inflammation goes up, uh, which is an antibacterial generally response, so that if you do get injured by a predator, you will, your body will heal better. On the other hand, your antiviral response, so it goes down because, you know, our bodies are uh, always trying to conserve energy. So if you are trying to boost something, you usually have to save the energy somewhere else. And it saves it on the antiviral response, but because as we know it, we catch viruses from other people, right? So if you are alone, this risk goes down. So our antiviral response goes down, which unfortunately in modern times, it means that when you are feeling lonely, you are 
worse prepared to deal with viruses. Also, you get worse response to vaccination, for instance. There are studies showing that when people are isolated, their bodies don't produce the same levels of antibodies after uh, vaccination, for instance, to flu or hepatitis than they do if they are not feeling isolated. But, and on the other hand, your inflammation, so this bacterial, bacterial protection really is really up. And unfortunately, long term, inflammation can lead you know, to plenty of different diseases from like Alzheimer's, diabetes, cardiovascular problems. So being alone is a, a natural state for our body and a state that we recognize as a state of danger. I think it's so fascinating how you can shift towards genetic expression that primes you for this inflammatory state, as well as a sympathetic state to some extent as well. So you talked about how inflammation can lead to myriad disease, Alzheimer's, diabetes, and your research is into how does isolation and loneliness lead to accelerated aging and how does it how does it reduce our longevity. So where we've started is okay we're by ourselves we're turning on our stress signals and now we've created inflammation talk to me a little bit about how the individual who lives in with this long-term state of isolation fares worse when it comes to chronic disease and it comes to dying early and all of the things that it seems we're all trying to avoid yeah, so for instance, you know, research shows that people who are chronically isolated, they are at a two and a half higher risk of premature death, for instance. They are also they also have shorter telomeres, so those protective caps at the ends of your chromosomes that take important part in aging. Uh, they have exactly higher inflammation levels, they have higher blood pressure as well, and as we've mentioned before, they respond worse to vaccination. Uh, so there is plenty of things going on when you're isolated. But an important thing to recognize here as well, which is, I think, particularly vital in pandemic times, that it's all about how you measure loneliness. And um, generally in research, when the scientists are trying to establish whether somebody is isolated and lonely, uh, the questions they ask is, is there someone in your life that you can count on? Is there someone that would help you if you're sick? Is there someone who would bring you soup in the middle of the night kind of thing? Is there someone who would drive you to the doctor, to the airport? Is there someone you can call if you're feeling down? And if the answer to those questions is yes, then generally you are not isolated, you are not lonely, so which actually is good news from the pandemic perspective, because even though we are often physically uh, isolated from our friends, we still know, you know, if you have friends like that, you know they are still there and you know they would still drop you that zoop at your doorstep, even if they couldn't, you know, physically see you, they could still do that and they could still, you know, they could still help you, they, you could still call them. So. It's not exactly the type of loneliness and isolation that usually in research is showed as very detrimental to health. Um, this kind of isolation is when you really know there is no one there who would help you, to whom you can call. Nobody, there is nobody in whom you can confide, right? But if you have friends, even in pandemic, you can always call them, you can Zoom, Zoom them, you can Skype them. Uh, there are options, right? So this is not exactly the same thing we are we are seeing. Even though you know not being physically with our friends is also difficult. That's certain. You know we we are physical creatures, and for instance, when we touch, when we hug, when we look directly into each other's eyes, we get this boost of social hormones such as oxytocin, for instance, the so-called love hormone. Uh, so so there are things happening when we are in physical contact as well which is also important for health, but it's not as detrimental as this kind of isolation when we're talking about not having anybody at all in your life. 